seat next to me. And the first question. Why would that be unlikely? <laughs> Never. Uh, can you talk to us now? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have no idea where David's been this morning and we're not going to discuss it. Uh, he's just uh, had his whole focus on coming to the Women's Football Forum. So let's talk women's football. <laughs> women's football seems to have grown exponentially uh, in the last year. The Westfield Matildas, uh, we've discussed it several times today, a sellout crowd uh, up in Penrith. The new CBA deal... Uh, Westfield W League for players, W League in its 10th season, uh, and female participation continuing to increase year on year. As CEO, what do you put all of that down to? Well, obviously not one single thing. I think the, the planets have lined up a bit um, across a few levels. Um, you've probably already talked today a little bit about the strategic choices that have been taken by the game to integrate women's football into the sport and, and try to keep it from being siloed off um, into one section of the business. So certainly in terms of how we've organised ourselves within FFA, that was a big choice um, and one made a number of years ago. Um, what, does that, what does that produce? I think there's also uh, a contextual thing in Australian sport, which is that 10 or 15 years ago, sports became much better at introductory programs for kids uh, to give them a chance to just play the game. Um, in football, of course, it was small-sided football, um, but equally introductory programs were in, put in place in cricket, um, rugby league, um, uh, rugby union, AFL, uh, of course, and what we've seen 10 or 15 years later is the fruits of those programs where um, young girls had a chance to try the sport. Um, lo and behold, some of them turned out to be pretty bloody good at it, uh, and we're seeing them uh, out on the pitch tonight, um, elite athletes who play the game with great skill. But if those introductory programs hadn't been put in place 10 or 15 years ago, Sport in those days uh, didn't really matter what you played. Sport was very much just for the kids who were good at it. Um, and sometimes kids who were actually good at it didn't really get a chance. Um, they went off and did other things. So something, something more general happened in Australian sport. And football, of course, grabbed that opportunity on a few levels. Um, tenth year of a national competition now. So we've been trailblazers in that sense giving a pathway to our best players uh, to play in a national competition. We've made strategic choices around uh, the Matildas and even in recent times, um, we've done things like put the Matildas into the Tournament of Nations uh, in California, like um, make sure that we had good home opposition for September games in Penrith and Newcastle and make sure that uh, we kept that up in Victoria tonight and in Geelong on Sunday. Uh, and those sorts of things are all have come together at a nice moment for us, I think, when you see Sam Kerr uh, do backflips, when you see her talk about why she wants to play football and not pursue other sports. Um, then you get a sense that the strategic choices that the sport's taken uh, are starting to bear fruit. Um, but I, I think at the core of that, I, I'd like to think, is that we, we made a decision... Uh, a few years ago within the business of, of football that we weren't going to leave women's football off to one side. Um, of course, we have a head of women's football and that's important as well. Um, but we, would, we were very conscious that uh, we wanted eventually to get to a point where we don't even really talk about women's and men's football, we just talk about football. Um, and I think the success of the Matildas is starting to produce a bit of that where we're not only inspiring young girls to play the game, young women to play the game, but our female players are actually inspiring boys to play the game. And, and, and so we'll get to a point where we... we and, I, and I think there are sports that are ahead of us on this in, in some respects. So the success of women's tennis, for instance. Um, they don't really talk about women's tennis and men's tennis, they just talk about tennis. Football will get to that point if we keep integrating women's football into everything we do. Well, the growing women's participation, as you say, it's a strategic imperative for FFA. Do you see it uh, now as something that you, you almost really have to be doing because we, we've done it for years, but it's now de rigueur for every sport to have a women's team? Or do you see it as still being a growth opportunity for football? 
it's definitely our fastest growing area. And, and again, I talk about Aldi Mini Roos. Um, we're seeing our biggest growth in in female participation at that at that early introductory level, um, because the sport is safe, it's skillful, it's simple, um, and there's a, an aspirational element to it uh, with the W League, with the Matildas. Um, so I, I think there's a lot that can still be done, but I think um, participation will continue to. Uh, be on a nice, nice growth trajectory um, because of the uh, the things that are intrinsic about the sport um, in its simplicity, uh, its availability, uh, but also in now um, being a sport of choice for good female athletes. Kimon, can you talk to that from an FFV perspective? What appointments and strategy have you put into place uh, to increase female participation? So I think uh, from a, a federation perspective, a Football Victoria perspective, uh, we're in the business of participation. So uh, our focus and our priority is to ensure that in every community, in, in every community in Victoria where you will find a football club, there is an opportunity for girls to play. And so what does that mean? Uh, there are a couple of things, a couple of challenges. We've talked talked about the cultural challenges in terms of uh, the unconscious bias and the natural affinity for, for boys to play sport and that not necessarily being the case for girls. And we've talked about what's exploding that, what's un, undoing those perceptions. Uh, from, a, from an administration perspective, it's incumbent on us to help clubs with that, to help them work through that and address some of the things that Melissa and G identified when they talked about the way in which they were introduced to the game. But once, once they're introduced, then then from a, for, I guess using business terminology, there needs to be retention. So what does that mean? Well, it probably means that they have to have a decent coach because the coach is the one that will create the environment and the experience that they will have two times a week and on the weekend. In addition to that, they need to be able to feel as if it's a welcoming environment where they'll be respected as individuals and as players. Okay, so that's the club, the club administration, the culture of the club and being able to understand that and stand for it and be proud of it and be able to take that position in the community. And then the facilities, of course, which we all know about, we've touched on that as well. So those are some of the critical elements uh, and that's an investment of resources because a big part of that is not only Football Federation understanding its responsibility, but then being able to convert that into education for clubs, some of whom not do it naturally, but most of whom would benefit from the IP that we've developed. So in a nutshell, it's simply an allocation of resources where they need to be applied, Steph, and uh, being clear on how we do that. As a sport, one of the great challenges we have, of course, is that we are, it's a, it's a user pay system, which means that we need to be particularly judicious about where we invest our resources. And it makes good sense for us to, to allocate those to women's sport, not just because it's the right thing to do, but it makes good business sense over the medium to long term. You mentioned facilities and rightly said it's come up a couple of times already. It seems to be quite a limiting factor. How much do you think it is limiting the growth of football? And is it a case of, as we suggested earlier, it's not spend the money and build it and they will come because we just can't physically build enough of those facilities? Is it the creation of a demand or, or how much of a problem is it? Well, it's, I guess it's always the, the challenge of building a platform and football is a platform and, um, you know, being able to develop the supply and, and the demand at the same time. Uh, so facility simply means, I guess, not necessarily more grounds but possibly lights, as we discussed, you know, or synthetic, which means that there are, there are more spots available for teams to play and that the current demand, which is extraordinary of men and boys football uh, essentially uh, um, um, dominates the supply of pitches and facilities. So unless we can unlock that, unless we can increase the supply of facilities, we're surely not going to be able to, uh, to support the growth. And is the trickle and effect of that the fact you're going to need change rooms? That seems to be the sticking point as far as facilities well, I, go. I, I think, I mean, if you speak to anyone who's been involved in women's football and, and, and young girls that have played football, it's a critical part of it. And uh, that's a part of providing a safe and comfortable environment, which is the minimum they should expect to be able to play uh, sport or football in their own community. They also, can I just jump in there? 
because um, my observations around the change room aspect as well is you can build the change room, but are the girls still going to get priority access? Uh, not seriously. But I remember my I played recreational football here in Victoria. I won't name the club. Um, turned up to the first game new female change rooms that were developed and we still didn't get into the change rooms because the boys and the men took priority. So um, I still think that, you know, there's it has to be wrapped in, up in a kind of whole collective of changes that it's not just about building but it's actually making sure that the club also changes their culture in terms of how they prioritise the team. Emma, I want to talk to you about uh, participation numbers and the FFA strategy aims to reach is at 120,000 by 2019. Uh, how big a part do you see Victoria playing that? Because they are very, very strong in the whole strategy. I think Victoria plays a massive part in that. I think that, you know, both Kimon and Helen and other people here, we've all talked about our ambitions to, to grow participation here in Victoria. Um, I'd like Victoria to be the first state that gets to to 50-50 um, gender split at the grassroots and Kimon and I have, have spoken about this. Um, uh, and I think that we acknowledge that probably we haven't grown as quickly as, as we could have um, in certain age groups. So I think there's a massive opportunity. Uh, we've got some great clubs here in Victoria that are in a good position um, to actually increase the participation uh, for girls. But for us, you know, uh, we have, you know, uh, States across Australia, every state obviously needs to be growing participation. From my perspective, it's important that wherever a girl lives, that she has the opportunity to go to a local club, she has a good experience, it's a quality facility and she's welcomed. Whether she's a talented player or just participating. I was talking to someone before about... I think in football as well, sometimes we, we only value the talented player. We have to value everyone. Um, and I think the soccer mum before that was talking about her child not getting into the, the MPL, um, I hope she's not lost the football because for, to me she's as valuable playing in any level of the game as she is in MPL or Matilda's W League. And I think that if we have that mindset, then we make sure that we support girls no matter what their motivations are in the game. So are there programs and initiatives in place to, to help that happen? I mean, that's part of the journey that we're on and that starts out with education. For us, it's about starting at that kind of grassroots level, particularly with the mini roos space. We want more girls-only teams. We want, um, you know, better coaches and support in that space. Um, and then we need to think about the different programs that we actually start to develop in partnership with FFE, with, with A-League and W-League clubs around providing girls with, uh, and women with more choice so that there's less... It's not just about providing structured play, but it's also about providing unstructured opportunities to play football as well. And what are the challenges? The, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it is, uh, I think it's interesting because, as I said before, and I you know, reflect on my time in England, um, sports are geared up to deliver through club football. Um, we have membership, we have national registration fees. I'm sure, I'm sure there's people in the room that are not happy about those uh, registration fees that, that we have to pay uh, in various levels. So the, the sports are kind of designed in a certain way. The challenge sometimes is that when you're creating different programs, who's going to create those programs? Do they sit within the club? Do they sit within uh, you know, another um, organisation that can support those individuals? So some of those things are challenging um, uh, but I think that there's certainly the opportunities there and I know that Victoria have already started to do some good work around you know summer football uh, six aside seven aside we need to make sure that we're actually packaging those opportunities so that we're talking to girls um, so you know the football itself might be the same um, but how are we promoting that so girls actually understand that that's for them and I think that's a that's a big issue. Helen, can you talk to us about how the culture at FFV maybe has changed or is changing to support women's football? Um, well, just recently in October, Kimon, on behalf of the organisation, signed, along with 20 other state sporting organisations and clubs, the Vic Health Gender Equality Leadership Pledge. And what we signed up for was three things. One, to celebrate our sports men and sports women equally. Uh, two, to achieve gender equality or gender balance at our events and throughout all our marketing. And three, to prioritise access to facilities to women and girls in the spaces that we use and the spaces that we have some, not control over, but but can encourage other clubs to, to do that. 
and we've been already working on a lot of those things. So I think from uh, Tao's marketing team especially is really good at promoting our girls because he's a big ambassador of the women's game. Um, I've met with our events company to, for them to understand, you know, what we need to do as an organisation in terms of having, you know, traditional female roles at, at our event ceremonies also being done by men um, and that they include females on panels and have female MCs like you, Steph. Um, yeah, they wanted to give us Simon, but we chose you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <Easy>. and <laughs> thanks. Easy and also, in terms of the facility space, I mean, this year for our state one men's, it came to my attention through my women's standing committee. The boys played their grand final at Port Melbourne, but the girls played their grand final at a facility at Satellite Cities Ground, which was definitely not up to stretch for our premier state competition. Um, and you know, when I've looked at that, it's because there was a flaw in the actual process. We were giving clubs the opportunity to choose whether they wanted to host women or girls events. We can't do that. And, you know, clubs themselves need to also offer us support to grow the girls game. When I was in competitions, I found it really hard to find clubs that would support me on getting space available, Kimon remembers this, to put on Team App Cup finals and things like that. They didn't want it. Um, because the boys' game, they could charge at the door and their canteen would, would you know, make a bit more money. What the clubs themselves need to support the female game as well. I want to come to you on participation in okay. a minute, but just uh, to sort of re reflect on something you said about uh, <laughs> Simon. Uh, my husband, Simon Hill, hosted the... He did my job at the New South Wales version of this event. And I just want to let you know that his feedback, and he's done a lot of football events and be involved in a lot of football discussion, he said it is the most enjoyable football event he's ever done. He said everyone in the room was engaged and they weren't there to argue, they were there to talk about how things could get better and I think that's a real reflection on where we've come in, in women's football. So I'm sorry you didn't get him, Helen, but... Uh. No, that's okay, Steph. <laughs> settled for you. Ke Ke <laughs> settled, bless. <laughs> oh, damn me with faint praise. <laughs> You're both equally Feel free as good. to stick up for any time you want, David. <laughs> we should have had Simon and you. That would have been a, we could have had a double act. No, that was gender we would balance. Bicker, yeah, anyway. <laughs> that would be entertaining. <laughs> All right, back to the program. Uh, Helen, tell us how your programs within FFE are changing to increase participation. Um, well, Emma touched on that slightly. So we're we're currently reviewing, uh, you know, a lot of the products. We've been notorious for getting a males or a product that works for boys and putting a skirt on it. Um, so we're <laughs> currently doing a review on, on the programs, whether it's, you know, the formal competitions or our social packages. So we've partnered up with Melbourne City to do the Soccer Mums program um, to increase participation for the older females or females with, with kids. We have our Summer 7 series, so we offer girls only and mixed competitions in, in that space. We're really targeting on the Aldi Mini Roos girls only teams rather than the mix. But, but we find through some work that Emma and, and Sarah Walsh did in Northern New South Wales that girls want the option. So it's, it's really reviewing the, the research that we have and making sure that we're offering the packages for these girls to play, whether they want to go through the elite pathway or just play socially. David, before we open it to the floor, could you uh, perhaps sum up what you think for the growth of women's football, what you find the biggest challenges are? I mean, I think the, the, the things that are challenges we've talked about, and they're, and they're mainly at the, at the grassroots, the, very, the, the ability to um, be able to fund things like separate change rooms, like adequate facilities, so you don't force the over 35 women's comp to play at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night um, because you've got a decent surface for them to play on. All of that stuff, um, it costs money, of course, um, and everything in sport costs money. I said to someone the other day, it's not that old English comedy show, The Good Life, um, where they managed to live out of what they grew in their backyard in London and no one really asked how they paid the electricity or the <laughs> telephone bill. Um, fo football at every level, whether it's um, improved conditions, which we've um, managed to put in place for the W League through work with the PFA in the last six months, um, whether it's that or right down to what a grassroots club can afford, 
these are challenges to um, getting girls the opportunity to play. Um, there are still big gaps in terms of um, gender in the sport at, at, at every level. Um, we've got players that will have arrived in the last couple of days to play in this game um, from overseas and they're sitting in economy class seats. Um, when the soccer is travel, they're travelling in business class. Is this right? Of course not. Um, these are the types of things that, that, that are challenges at the very top, but I'm sure all the people who work here in um, grassroots football could give me a million examples uh, of where increased resources uh, and money could help them improve uh, the ability to not only give girls a chance to play, but um, retain them as, as, as players. Um, and everything that happens in the game, from last Wednesday, the soccer is making a World Cup, I said on the night, that's going to encourage a whole lot of six and seven-year-old boys and girls to, to play the game, as will tonight. It'll encourage um, someone who's playing over 45s or over 35s to go, you know what, I'm going to pull the boots out for one more season. I'm inspired by that. Um, so all of this stuff is important. There's no golden, there's no golden answer to it. How many physios and doctors would be rubbing their hands together at that thought? <laughs> uh, ladies, gents, uh, anything to add before we open it to the floor? I'll, I'll just make one point. I'd just like to, to pick up on, on Helen's comment. Um, the challenge for us as an organisation and perhaps as a society too, but I can speak specifically about the FFE, is that um, we have to change the way we go about doing our business because... We've, we're accustomed to doing it a certain way. And certainly from my experience, um, I've grown up and been a part of male professional sport. And as a result of that, it's, a, it's provided me with a limited lens on what I know. And so what we're understanding and where I think this momentum is leading us is that we're becoming more aware of uh, the broader implications and the broader benefits of... Uh, of sport and what it can do for communities um, and equality of genders. And so I think the things that, that Helen was talking about and, and, and the, uh, the, the tangible changes we need to, to implement actually means we have to review the way we go about ma doing our business, making our decisions and where resources go. So it's actually having a profound impact on us and it will have an increasingly pr profound uh, outcomes as we continue to build some momentum in this space. Can I just add something as well? I think that what both Kimon and David are talking about is is definitely, you know, I concur with those comments. And I think for us in football, there's um, so much that we'd like to achieve for the whole game. And there's only so much resourcing. And we have to make these strategic choices. Um, and sometimes that's tough. And some of the strategic choices we've made around the, the pay conditions for W League meant that we couldn't invest in other areas of the game. And that was absolutely the right decision um, to make. Um, but from my experience over the last probably eight years and kind of my journey as a female, there's also lots of things we can do that are not about um, investment. And um, when I speak to the players, uh, a lot of it is about respect. And I think that if you show respect to a girl, whether she's four, whether she's a W League player, whether she's in the Matildas, that actually goes a long way and that doesn't cost anything. Um, and, um, and that probably means more to those players and the monetary value. And the case study that Maria touched on before at Portland Fawns, when I speak to a Claire Polkinghorne who was over there, the biggest thing she says is that she felt respected by that club. Everything was the same. She felt she was exactly the same as the men's team. So that would just be the thing that I think if we can take away from today, I think that's something that everybody from today could actually action. Sure. Okay, folks, your turn. As before, raise your hands. We have uh, one over here, and uh, we'll go. I think we've got about 20 minutes, so uh, we'll get in as many as we can. And can I ask you please to stand when you ask your question so we know where it's coming from? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm actually a soccer mum. I have two daughters. One has is been playing uh, NPL. She's going into her third year. And I have another daughter. Um, who I'm hoping will stay in community. Um, we're, uh, we've just changed clubs, so um, 
My name is Vasilka um, and we've just gone to um, South Melbourne Football Club. But I had the privilege of being part of the Bulleen uh, parent community at Bulleen Lions. And we had a, a really interesting year. And that was mainly to do with, um, we went to China, um, the under 15s and played in China for the girls. And I guess what that meant was we got a really good close look at um, what's important for girls, what inspires performance, because we were living with them as chaperones for 10 days. And I have to say it was a real privilege to be part of that, that group. But one thing that I haven't heard much of today is about program content. We've heard about participation, getting young women and girls to turn up and to be interested in football. But we haven't heard about what happened, the other stuff that goes on that's not technical. And I'm, I guess I'm talking about mental health and wellbeing, about leadership programs and mentoring within, at, at the NPL level particularly. And um, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about that, given that we have the federal peak body here and the state peak body. Um, I guess um, being... Uh, the thing about football, it's about where young women gather and I see it as an opportunity. I see it as an opportunity because they are going to be leaders they are going to be tradies, they're going to be academics, they're going to be professional women, they're going to be carers and mothers tomorrow. And I guess it's about um, giving them something else in terms of what football offers Helen, in terms of life like skills. Yeah. I, I can answer that. Uh, you touched on a couple of things there. So firstly, I could... I was one of the people responsible for ma running, managing this event and I could have us here for 10 days straight and we still wouldn't touch on everything every one of you wanted to hear about. Um, and this was mainly about participation. In my talk tomorrow, I do touch on, the, on you know, things like the mental health issues and, and the things that girls ch face when they're um, having to do so many things. Now, in terms of your mentoring and the, and the stuff you talked about in the administration space, so every year we run a, a mentorship program with club administrators. I was involved with it last year when I was outside of the FFE. Um, and Carol Fox, I don't know if Carol's still in the room. Carol, stand up for me. Please stand up. So Carol Fox is running it for us um, next year. And we, we, we will put through 30 women into that program and we find mentors for them and they select a project and we help them along the leadership journey. So we offer that support. We do get some funding to do that, but I mean, we are really, again, under-resourced, so I need to pick and choose where, where my resources go. But we have identified that due to the WMPL and the MPL um, environment and the fact that some of the clubs are going to full-time administrators as a result of all the paperwork we make them do, um, we are finding that, the, you know, that space definitely needs to be more supported. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great point. I think that um, we've certainly got better at supporting the Matildas at a national level. Um, in terms of providing uh, support to be an athlete, um, but also, um, uh, you know, to, 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 I suppose, to function, because it's obviously there's a lot of pressures at the national level. I'm sure there's lots of W League clubs that are also starting to provide that broader support um, uh, to females. And, um, you know, there, um, there's still a lot more that we can do. And I think that, you know, I'd love to do something focused in Victoria around the, the MPL environment to make sure that we're um, supporting uh, MPL players and, and making sure that um, they're achieving their potential. Um, the MPL is a very important area in terms of development uh, of the game and there's a lot of, um, you know, players in that space and I'm sure there's lots of clubs that would love support to do different things to support um, players in that space as well. Emma Highwood is actually one of the mentors next year. I haven't told her yet, but... <laughs> no, I, I know, I, know, I am. <laughs> uh, over here on the right, yep. Yeah, hi, it's Simon Crawford from 
Going? Yep, Simon Crawford from uh, Wyndham Council out in Melbourne's outer western suburbs. Um, we've got the facilities, the lights, the synthetics, um, and we do have some really good clubs. Kimmon, I, I noticed you say Steve's presenting it at some time during the forum. That'd be, I think that's great, and it'd be good to get his thoughts on this as well. But um, a lot of the other large sports have your regional development officers that get out there and give the clubs hands-on support, um, you know, remembering that they are mostly um, volunteer run. I'm just wondering if, if there are, uh, is there, if there is the capacity at FFE to um, be more hands-on with clubs and, and give them that support. Uh, thanks for the question, Scott, uh, and, and thanks for coming. Scott, wasn't it? Sorry. Simon. Sorry, Simon. <laughs> Scott would suit you as well, I, I think. <laughs> <clears throat> I think it's it, it's a good question, and I think you know we keep talking about limited resources. Yes, that's a reality. It is an absolute reality of our sport because we are the economics of our sport are different to the other codes, as David alluded to. We don't have the benefit of having uh, uh, the commercial properties and assets that derive revenues that can then be invested at grassroots. That's a reality. So, what does that mean? It means it's incumbent on us to innovate and be more effective in, what, in using what we do have. So, for example, at a time like this, there's a reason that this forum is being held here today. There's a reason that David and Emma and Mark are here. There's a reason that JP and the senior executive team are here organising this. Because it's absolutely critical that we demonstrate to the Victorian government what we need to do to support the growth of women's football. And... Part of that means being able to invest resources to support growth. So where we do have resources, uh, so where we do have facilities, Simon, we do need to be able to service it. We do need to be able to service the clubs with the ability to grow their participation, particularly around coaches and administrators and even the education around the culture that the board needs to have to provide the environment that Emma talked about. So at a time like this, if we take a a return on investment perspective, we need to invest in growth. That means we need to ensure that we have people or boots on the ground or we're effectively deploying technologies that allow us to be effective at the local level. So in your case, um, it seems to me that in that particular instance, the investment needs to be in and around supporting clubs and coaches to drive the numbers. In other areas, such as in a metro Melbourne, we know the challenge might be facilities or something of that nature. So it very much depends on what the program is. But from our perspective, we're absolutely committed and allocating FFE resources in growth because growth is the way in which we will underpin our uh, economy and our economic cycles, and what that'll allow us to be able to achieve some of the things that we've talked about. Um, my name's Michael Hines, I'm from the city of Ballarat, and I'm a strategic planner in specifically recreation, so I um, advise the council in regards to where we spend our money in sport and recreation. Um, my question's probably too pronged and you probably answered it a little bit there anyway. Um, and it's about that, I suppose, that data in regards to understanding what your gr soccer growth is um, and what infrastructure we do need into the future. So obviously it could be either Kim or David to answer the question. One of the big roles we need to understand as a council and with our growth in Ballarat is um, growing very quickly and the expectation to 2040 we could nearly double in size. So we need to understand, OK, how many facilities we need, how many ovals we need, so we can plan ahead. Um, are you doing that work um, so you can inform, I suppose, that other councils and ourselves so we can plan going forward? And the second question probably for you, Kim, you spoke about before um, about your IP and listen to all the different um, conversations we've had so far. Um, I think one of the gaps I'm feeling and having a background in different sports is the IP around parents. Um, we can give all the IP we want to the players and the, and the um, coaches, but if we can't educate the parents as well, um, majority of parents will get it, but there'll be ones that don't. Um, is there strategies in place to actually put some sort of IP or some sort of program in so the parents understand what they can do to support their kids and their children going through sport? Uh, thank you for the question, David. Do you mind if I, I, I'll address that and then perhaps defer to you? Um, thanks. Uh, firstly, in, in, in relation to facilities in particular, uh, earlier this year we completed an audit of all the football facilities 
in Victoria. <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, we then projected that with the current level of growth that we're expecting over the next 10 year period. And <clears throat> what the data showed us, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, is that we will require another 500 pitches in the next 10 years. So <laughs> that's quite a few. And so the main point there being we understand that there will be increased demand. Now, a new pitch doesn't necessarily mean a full new pitch. It just means a pitch worth of output. So there are ways in which we can break it down. Lights or synthetic then gives us greater utility and greater outputs. So there are ways in which we can break the numbers down, but they all require resources. So what are we doing about that? Uh, well, that's once again uh, uh, leads to the reason that we're here today, because a lot of this data and this information uh, is important to the government as well as to local council. And without that information, you're unable to um, make the optimal decisions in terms of the allocation of your, your resources. So that's incumbent on us. And that will be occurring over the next 12 months, having completed that, that audit earlier this year. Now, that's the first question. So, uh, uh, and of course, um, next year's an election year. And so what we have realised is that because of our participation rates, People care a lot about football, and they care a lot in each of the communities, in each of the, uh, in each of the, uh, the, the, the state and federal seats. So it's also important for us to ensure that our parents and players and communities understand that it's possible for them to also participate in supporting us in growing facilities. Now, as far as the IP is concerned, the data is also an important piece of IP, of course, but when it comes to parents, we very much rely on the clubs. We very much rely on the clubs promoting a positive, uh, inclusive culture. And ultimately that comes down to the committee and the board and the coaches. Those two within each club have the greatest amount of impact on the way in which parents behave and conduct themselves. So that is a focus of ours and that's what our research shows us. And so that's perhaps somewhat of an answer to your second question. Yeah, I, I think in some respects we've got a, we've got a lot of the data. The, the next phase is how we coordinate and collaborate our efforts to use that data effectively so that we can tell you, because we've mapped it, we know each uh, federal seat in the country, where football clubs are, um, what facilities they're using, etc. But the next phase is how do we ensure that when we go to the decision makers, we're going in a coordinated way um, because you, someone like someone like you in Ballarat is not going to be well impressed if one week um, your local club turns up knocking on your door, the next week the state federation, the next week perhaps the national body has someone on the ground. So I think the next phase for a lot of this stuff is to be coordinated in our, in our effort. One of the single most important things that has happened to us in the last... Uh, close to 12 months now is the Ausplay numbers came out um, and for perhaps the first time there was a, a, a recognised measure of participation that couldn't be fudged by sports which showed that we were by far and away ahead of, of all the other sports in, in our pure numbers um, and that has been really powerful for us. I don't know if you've seen but the fresh set of numbers came out um, just in the last week or so and, and again a, our numbers dwarf those of, of other sports. Um, but how do we use that information effectively? We've invested um, just in the last six to 12 months in our digital offering um, for all levels of, of the game ultimately to be able to be coordinated in how we talk to um, our participants and, and how they talk to each other effectively through registration systems, through competition management systems, um, through how they access um, as fans of the A-League, the W-League, the Soccers and the Matildas. So that's been a big investment for us and we're sort of only halfway across the river um, in getting that stuff um, properly done. Um, but you'd, you'd be surprised how much data we've got, um, but you wouldn't probably be surprised to know we're still not great at using it. I know this, uh, that question came to our two more, most senior people on this panel. But there's a lot of L LGAs being represented in the room and I know um, of a couple of councils this year that went ahead and did their, um, or 
their plan for their future facilities without even consulting us. So I get that, um, you know, you're expecting or a lot of you expect us to put out the reports, but it's we are the biggest sport in Victoria and nationally that gets played on a pitch. So when a council is putting together their policies around their facilities and, and, and allocating resources to it, then they also have to accept some responsibility of coming and seeking information from us. We're not always as organised as some of the other codes in publishing it, but we, you know, we're happy to be there. And if your contact in the office is not there, you know, you, you need to keep f chasing us so that we... C not chasing us. Like, of, we're, of, of course we're going to be there. Yeah. But um, find the next person that can, that can be on that, you know, steering committee and assist you in in planning for those facilities. Because, like I said, we've heard of a couple of councils this year that have gone ahead and, and done their facilities plans with even consulting the largest field-based field sport um, in the state, which is pretty disappointing. Mm. Uh, we've got to, these are the, the last three. Uh, we have one over here, one at the back, you're next, and then there's one in the middle who you've had your hand up for quite a while, gentleman in the white shirt. Can I? Flick the switch to something slightly different, but it, it, it fits in this. We're actually a world leader in one area, and Helen's figures will tell us that we're very poor in a mirror of that. So our proportion of women referees is way lower than any of us want. But we're actually at the very top of women and refereeing in the world. Um, so the last major um, event, the gold medal match, um, you know, uh, was uh, an Australian. We've, we've punched above our weight for years and years and years. And I love when I watch NWSL games from the United States and reflect back, we have got minimum three, usually four women officials at our National League and you're lucky to see one over there. So we're kicking goals at one end and getting it all wrong at the other. So what new things, not the same old things, but what new things are we going to do about lifting the grassroots of refereeing because that's where we want to model and that's where we want to see success and improvement and opportunity for women to participate. So great at one end. In Victoria, not happening. What are we going to do? Who wants it? <laughs> well, thank you for the question, Maria. <laughs> and you know what the great thing about this is? You're the one who's going to answer it. And the reason is that because Maria is the head of our Women's Standing Committee and uh, the question is entirely correct. There are many problems that we have. That's just one. And the solutions don't always lie in a head office at the FFA or the FFE. The, the solutions are very much a part of what our community can identify and then how we can make it happen. So I don't think there's necessarily a silver bullet, uh, Maria, um, but, I'm, um, but I'm really pleased that you're going to be a part of solving it. I think, but I think what I would say is what Maria's highlighting is that... Um, you know, there's obviously a massive opportunity because we've got a lot of females that are kicking goals internationally, um, that are respected, that we can probably utilise. So I think perhaps FFA and FFE need to get, be a bit better coordinated in making sure that we're leveraging those opportunities. You know, in the W League, you get to see a lot of uh, female referees, um, you know. And, you know, why can't we see more female referees in the A League as well? They're probably some of the things that we should we actually should start to explore. Well, Estelle, who's um, the central, central referee to, at tonight's game, she's coming to have a chat to our Pink Whistle program. So, Maria, I'll get you in the room tomorrow. Um, and, yeah. So, anyone that wants to come and watch her speak, we've currently got about 20 female referees registered f for that. Please come and approach me so I can get you there. We're having it at Sports House. Opposite um, MSAC. At the back. Uh, hi, my name's Deb. Um, actually, leading on from that, so my question is how are we going to get quality for female games to get referees? Because at the moment, you're lucky sometimes if a ref turns up, especially in the junior girl games, so under 14, under 16, under 18, but looking at the women as well. So, how are we going to get that gender bias out of it? Gender bias in terms of having more female referees or having more more female games with appointed referees, sorry? Yes, just to have a ref turn up. Okay, that, that is a challenge. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, I, th I think that's not, it's not unique to women's and girls' football. Uh, it's endemic across, um, across our football in Victoria in that um, on occasions we don't have referees uh, turning up when they should be there. Now, there are any number of reasons for it. And I've got to say that um, the, 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 the frequency with which that has been happening is reducing. And, there's a, and the reason for that is because I have a, lot, a good deal of confidence in our referees department headed up by Luke Brennan. I think he's a real pro. And he applies himself with uh, with uh, with great great vigour, but it's a problem we have generally for a couple of reasons. One, we don't have enough referees. Two, we can't attract enough referees. Two, we can't retain them. Why? Why would you ever want to be a referee and confront some of the behaviour that they experience? Like seriously, okay? It's not good enough. So we come back to the earlier question about parents and coaches and clubs. You know, what, do we, what environment do we expect the referees to be operating? How do we expect a 16-year-old boy or girl to want to referee and to aspire to referee uh, if they're constantly the, the victim of abuse and vilification? It's completely unacceptable. It's not acceptable on the street and it's not acceptable on the football field. So I think the, the problems are endemic um, from a cultural perspective. And from an organisational perspective, there are some limitations too. So uh, acknowledge your, your question. Uh, uh, well, um, not necessarily. It may be in some cases, but certainly on the evidence, anecdotal evidence. Can I, can I speak to that? And no. I hate <laughs> OK, all right. Um, I spent six months in competition, so um, sometimes it's, it's actually our fault in terms of... Uh, or I'll put it back to facilities. There's a club that doesn't have female-friendly facilities, so we'll purposely schedule games to allow a two-hour gap for the change rooms to be become female-only to male-only, and then referees won't accept that appointment that's two hours away from something else when they can accept three games in a row and be paid better. Um, but I'm happy to look at the referee schedule and exactly what we're paying if, if that is causing a problem in terms of appointments. So there happened to be two gentlemen in white shirts sitting in the middle. Um, you, you were first, yes, yep, you. And uh, if we, sorry, we are out of time, so if we could just keep them quite tight. Thank you. All right. Um, so, so Emma, th this question is probably aimed more at you, um, or for you, I should say. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> look, the, the, I, I operate with a, uh, with a number of clubs um, at a pretty grassroots level, and our objective is to grow female participation. Um, so we've, we've gone through and analysed a, a, a lot of data, and we've, we, we've established that there's 42,000 more males in Victoria playing than there are females. And in the city where we operate, there are 2,500 more males playing than there are females. This is the city of Burundara. And then in this particular club, there's 424 more males participating than females. The, 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 females at the, the female contingent at the club is quite small. But the club's made a, 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 a concerted effort to, um, to, to reverse that, to actually grow female participation. And, and so um, we were set with a task of um, establishing how do, we, uh, yeah, how do we actually achieve um, bridging that gap. Um, and we decided that we were going to bridge that gap over a five-year period. So when we plotted all this out, what we said is for 2018, we've got to have 98 players. You know, it's quite specific, but we've got to have 98 players, right? So how do we do this? We set about a, a program. Um, we called it Girl Zone. We would have called it Mini Roos. Uh, we would have loved to have called it Mini Roos um, Kickoff. However, we wanted to make the program free. We wanted to get as many girls participating in the program as possible. Um, the Mini Roos kickoff program, I believe the fee is about $40 per participant. We can bring that down. Something like that. Um, we invested in coaches for this program. We invested $2,000 towards coaches. And for the numbers that we've got participating in the program, if we had been running the Mini Roos kickoff program, we would have had to have invested another $2,000. So that's $4,000 to run a free program to grow female participation in the city. So the question to you is how do we. How do we attack that issue, those barriers to entry? Um, how, how do we make the Mini Roos kickoff program, well, more affordable? 
So from our perspective, um, the cost that comes into the kickoff program is the equipment and also um, the equipment pack that participants get. Now, if it's going to be a particular um, issue, um, uh, and we don't set any specific uh, requirements for clubs to charge 100 bucks or 50 bucks, that's really up to the club to make that decision. But um, uh, we're more than open to being flexible around how we design those programs. The most important thing for us is that the girls actually start to play, but not that they actually you know, go through the program, but they continue to play, um, and, and that there is an option for them to play within the club going forward. So um, for us, we're, we're more than open to talk to you about ways to actually make that more accessible. Um, there's no specific requirement from a national level in that regard. Um, but what I would say is that what you're trying to achieve needs to be wrapped up in a, um, a broader strategy, um, uh, which is about in attracting girls to play, uh, you know, creating a team, and then from there, obviously, that team playing in a league. And my question would be, is, is the, are the girls that are playing moving into a boys' league, as in most majority of the players that they're going to be playing with are boys, or are, are there, is there an opportunity for those girls to play against girls? One of the things that we found, just from our research nationally, is there's a, there's a retention issue where girls start to play the game, but then they're forced into a mix, which is majority boy competition, and, and, and their first experience of kind of playing on a more regular basis is, is not always a, a good one. So I'm sorry, we only have time for one more question. I'm happy to... <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it after. Yeah. I think this is, I mean, that's a really great question. From our perspective, we don't want to be too restrictive. We want girls to play. So we're more than happy to work with anyone in the room around how we can use kickoff either from the promotional tools or the equipment, et cetera, to make that work. Um, we can be as adaptable as possible. There's no strict requirements from a national perspective. You don't want your question, sir? Got answered somewhere in the whole scheme of things. Um, folks, if you want to continue that discussion, we're going to have a quick break for afternoon tea. So if you wanted to uh, finish off whatever you had to explain there. <laughs> Thanks, uh, folks, Steve. just a few minutes. If you could just go and grab what you would like to eat and then bring it back. And as you leave, please, would you thank David Gallup, Emma Highwood, Kim on.